as um, I said, my name is Eva, um, and I will uh, talk to you about the immigrant native wage gap in the next 40 minutes. Um, before I start, I just want to um, clarify that this is work in progress. So I am sorry, um, I apologize that I won't be able to um, show you any definitely definite results or give any uh, answers on the questions that I'm going to raise. Um, I hope it will still be interesting though, and it will definitely be interesting for me to hear your feedback, comments, suggestions. I'm so very much looking forward to the discussion. What I uh, will do in the next 40 minutes, so I will first um, shortly introduce myself. Then um, I will clarify what I mean by labor market discrimination, just to make sure that we are on the same footing. And then I will um, shortly discuss two studies um, that I'm currently doing on the immigrant native wage gap uh, from a very different point of view. So one is a meta-analysis, another is an experiment. Um, I will go into more details, of course. And then finally, I will conclude. So very shortly um, about me, uh, as I was already said, I'm a labor economist. Um, I'm mostly working on labor market discrimination, which means that I use quantitative methods to measure, but most importantly, to explain labor market discrimination. I use mostly two types of uh, methodologies. So I use econometric estimation techniques and um, experiments. And I will show an example of uh, both of the, these in um, my presentation today. And um, as I said as well, I'm part of um, the NCCR on the Move, which is a, a network in Switzerland of people working on migration and mobility studies. Um, and uh, we have a website, of course, and uh, for the migration scholars amongst you, which I guess is a lot of you, um, it might be useful to have a look. We have a lot of um, stuff there. We have a data set that is um, mostly free to use. Uh, we have a blog series, uh, at the moment there is a blog series on um, the issues with um, COVID for young researchers, which is very interesting. And we also host our own um, seminar series, which could also be of interest to you. So we're checking out. Then uh, what do I mean by labor market discrimination? Um, of course, there can be many, many forms of labor market discrimination um, and also on many grounds. So just to specify, I specifically um, work on ethnic discrimination and discrimination against individuals with a migration background. And I specifically look at hiring discrimination and uh, wage discrimination, which is what I'm going to be talking about today. Um, just to clarify um, some concepts, some key concepts. So it's one of the main issues in the migration in the discrimination literature is um, the disentanglement between uh, disadvantage and discrimination. So I think we're all uh, very familiar with this type of headlines. Um, these are uh, recent headlines from the US talking about the black and white unemployment rate gap and the black white wage gap. Um, so it's clear that black people in the US are being disadvantaged but it does not necessarily mean that they are discriminated against. It's one of uh, possible explanations, but we could think of many other reasons why um, black people are more likely to be unemployed or earn less. Um, it could be that they have lower educational outcomes. Um, it could be that they select into different type of professions. It could be because there is hiring discrimination that black people have less experience and thus earn less. Um, so uh, it is a methodological challenge to disentangle um, this disadvantage from what is discrimination. And what we're facing with is really the same old uh, issue of correlation versus causation, which uh, all quantitative researchers amongst us are probably very familiar with. Um, probably have also seen these uh, graphs which have nothing to do with migration or uh, discrimination, uh, but are some somewhat silly examples of how correlation and causation are not um, the same thing. So what you see on the top graph is uh, the divorce rates in Maine um, and the per capita consumption of margarine. 
And for some reason, they seem to be very, very closely correlated. So they move uh, very similarly. But that does, of course, not mean that we can say that divorce causes people to consume more margarine or margarine consumption would cause divorce. Um, and the same thing is uh, true on the, the lower graph where we see an example with the number of people who drown by falling in a pool and the number of movies with Nicolas Cage. And again, weirdly enough, they move very um, similarly, but of course it's a bit far-fetched to say that Nicolas Cage causes people to drown. So um, the same is, uh, really what we see also in the discrimination literature, there is a clear correlation between um, wages and a person's ethnicity, but that does not mean that it is also a causal relationship necessarily. Then another uh, point is also that um, discrimination is not the same thing as racism. Um, just to, to point out, uh, that does not mean that disadvantage is not a real problem. It's just, uh, to be sure that we are all talking about the same things. Um, so second thing, discrimination is also not the same as racism. Racism is one potential ground for discrimination, but we can of course think about many other grounds. We can think about of ageism, sexism, ableism, etc. So the first um, study I want to talk about is a meta-analysis on the immigrant native wage gap. What is the motivation behind this study? There is scientific consensus on ethnic hiring discrimination. There have been many, many studies, uh, correspondence experiments uh, showing that minority candidates, people with an immigrant background um, have less chances of being invited for a job interview um, in, in specific settings, specific countries, specific times. And more recently, there has been a number of meta-analyses who show that this is really um, consistent. So overall, a minority candidate has to send out 50% more CVs, um, more job applications in order to be invited for the same number of job interviews as a majority candidate. So no discussion about um, ethnic hiring discrimination. There is also scientific consensus on the gender wage gap, which is um, what is small infographic is about. Also there, um, many studies show that women are paid less for the same job with the same skills as men. There is, however, no such consensus on the immigrant native wage gap. So that is um, what we aim to address, uh, which is meta-analysis. Um, so mainly we try and answer the question whether there is an immigrant native um, wage gap or an ethnic wage gap, but um, the, the method and the data we collect also allow us to answer a number of other questions uh, to get some insights into the mechanisms behind um, this wage discrimination if we find that there is wage discrimination. So we can um, get an idea of uh, the classical economic argument, is it statistical? discrimination or is it state-based discrimination. We can get some insight into um, whether there are ethnic hierarchies. So um, is it really just the fact that someone is an immigrant or a minority, or are there some immigrants, some ethnicities that are being discriminated against more than others? Um, and we can also get an idea of the effectiveness of anti-discrimination legislation. We have a large data set of um, estimates of the immigrant native wage gap, ethnic wage gap from many countries over a long uh, time period. And as you might know, the US has a very long history of anti-discrimination legislation, but the same is not true for Europe. Most European countries only implemented some form of anti-discrimination legislation in 2001. So if this uh, legislation is effective um, on labor market discrimination, we should see this somehow in our data. So how do we do this? Um, we collect all papers who have estimated an immigrant native wage gap or a, a ethnic wage gap in the past. We do this by um, scanning two databases, Web of Knowledge and Econ papers. Uh, we've chosen these two databases because we want both published articles and working papers. 
um, why I will talk, tell you in a, in a couple of slides. And we've searched these databases uh, for a combination of these search terms um, that are displayed on the screen. And this resulted in 4,745 hits. Luckily for us, the vast majority of these papers uh, appear to be irrelevant. Uh, somehow, a lot of papers on migratory salmon come up if you implement these search terms. Uh, I don't know how the wage or earnings um, have anything to do with that, but um, and then uh, some papers seemed relevant on the first glance, but on closer inspection, they were not because they were simply descriptive. They did not estimate anything, for example. And we are currently um, collecting the data from the remaining studies, those that are interesting for us. Um, so what I will show you is um, some, some very first findings from a preliminary sample, a subsample of 11,515 estimates from 286 studies. So keep that in mind, it's not the full data yet. So what do we do with these estimates? Uh, we put them into this regression analysis where the outcome is the estimated wage gap. So the, the wage gap estimated by these papers. And then we control for a number of characteristics of these papers for the type of immigrant they look at, the methodology they use, um, the control variables the paper controls for, the country of the estimates, um, the time period. And um, finally, we include a dummy, which is one if the paper is published, which allows us to see whether there is publication bias in this literature. One could imagine that only papers that estimate a significant wage gap uh, actually get published. And if that is the case, we should be able to pick this up. So uh, one thing we control for is, uh, as I said, the immigrant characteristics. So we look at whether a paper um, it looks at immigrants, foreign born uh, individuals, um, second generation immigrants, so people who are native born but have parents who are born abroad, or um, third generation plus, uh, we call them, which means uh, native born ethnic minorities. And as you can see here from the graph, the, the largest chunk of the papers we have collected so far um, estimate the wage gap for foreign born individuals. And then we also look at um, the origin of the immigrants, if it's specified. Um, for the time being, we have to um, group them in uh, these broad categories. Hopefully, once we have the final database, we can be a lot more precise here. Uh, and as you can see, most of the papers um, fall into this other category, which means um, that they either did not specify an origin or they grouped um, groups together in a, in a different way than we did. Um, one paper, for example, grouped people from Switzerland and Eastern Europe, so that didn't fit in any of our categories. Then we also look at the methodological characteristics of the papers. Um, and the main issue is how they estimate the wage gap. And this goes back to what I said in the beginning about the correlation versus causality issue. Um, so it's not because there is simply a difference in the average wage between immigrants and natives or minorities and mi majorities um, that this means that this is a wage gap or wage discrimination. Um, and in general, there is two main uh, methods used in the literature to estimate this wage gap and or this wage discrimination. One of them is what we call a Minster equation or a wage regression, which is simple um, regression based analysis where there is a dummy variable, uh, which is one if a person is an immigrant and then they control for a whole host of um, variables and the coefficient of this dummy variable is simply the wage gap. Another method is a decomposition analysis here, um, two separate equations are estimated, one for the immigrant, one for the native. And the difference between these two is then decomposed into a part which can be explained by uh, difference in language skills, for example, um, and a part which is unexplained, which is left after all of the explained uh, parts are being extracted. And this unexplained part is what is then called labor market or wage discrimination. 
So we um, take into account which methodology, which of these two methods uh, the paper uses. And as you can see um, of the papers we have collected so far, the vast majority use a weight re regression and only 11% of them use decomposition analysis. Then we also um, look at whether the paper controls for selection or selectivity. What does this mean? So basically, whenever you're looking at a wage, this is a variable you only have for people who are in paid employment. And that's not an issue. If the chance of being in paid employment is the same for migrants as it is for natives or for minorities and majorities, but we know that this is not true. We know that the fact that you're a migrant makes that you're more likely to be unemployed. So if a paper does not take this into account, uh, we can expect the results to be biased. So we um, control for effect whether a paper controls for this, if that makes sense. And uh, as you can see here on the lower um, graph, only 7% of the papers we have collected so far um, do control for selectivity. Then we also uh, take into account which control variables um, the paper controls for. Um, so mo most papers control for some form of education, uh, the region, the age, um, half of the papers control for marital status, and then some papers also control for experience, language skills, gender, years in the country, um, occupation and working time. We take into account the country um, of the estimates. And as you can see on this graph, we have a quite a nice uh, geographical spread, but unsurprisingly, the majority of the estimates are from Northern America and to a lesser extent Europe. We also have quite a lot of estimates from China. And then we look at the time period of the estimates. We have estimates all the way back from to the 1800s, but the, the, the biggest chunk of the estimates is from the 1990s, 2000s and 2010s. So what do we find? If we simply plot um, all of these estimated gaps, we find on average a gap of minus 0.05. A minus here means that the immigrant earns less than a native or the minority earns less than the majority. So um, the expected sign. And this means that there is a wage gap of 5%. However, this is not significant. And this is mostly due to the huge variation of wage gaps that we have. So we have wage gaps ranging from minus 179% all the way to 200%. Then we can also look at um, ethnic hierarchies. And here we do see a clear pattern. So we see on the left-hand side of this um, graph that uh, immigrants from not Northern American regions earn slightly more than natives. All of the other groups of immigrants earn less, um, but there's large differences between them. So uh, immigrants from Western Europe earn about 3% less and uh, immigrants from Africa earn about 13% less. So big differences that are in this very dispersed uh, average numbers. And then some first results of the regression analysis. So these are all of the, the methodological uh, variables that we control for. Um, and if they are in green, it means that they significantly and positively influenced the wage gap and orange means significantly and negatively and all the others. So the, the white ones means uh, non-significant effect. So some interesting uh, results here. The methodology does not seem to matter, which is, I guess, comforting for the literature. Um, it, Papers that take language skills and occupation into account finds uh, significantly lower wage gaps. Um, and the type of uh, wage variable that is used also seems to have an impact. We do not find any uh, difference across the regions of the estimations, nor the time period. So that is quite surprising. And we also do not find evidence for publication bias. Uh, these are then the immigrant characteristics. So as compared to native born um, third generation, so ethnic minorities, 
uh, there is no difference in the wage gap for foreign borns or uh, native born second generation immigrants. Um, as opposed to women, we find that the wage gap is more negative for men, so a larger wage gap for men. This does not mean that there is no gender wage gap. It just means that the additional wage gap uh, caused by the ethnicity or, or the migration background is larger for men than it is for women. Uh, it might be on first um, glance counterintuitive, but it is something that has been found uh, quite a lot in this uh, literature. And then for the, um, the origins, we find very similar patterns to what was already uh, clear from the figure. So as uh, compared to Western Europeans, uh, we, North Americans have a, a smaller wage gap and all the others have a larger wage gap and this is significant for Latin Americans and Africans. So to conclude, um, we do not find evidence of an overall immigrant native wage gap, but we do find clear evidence of this ethnic hierarchy. So the wage gap is, seems to be very dependent on the origin or ethnicity. Uh, we do not seem to find that a methods, the method used makes a big difference. Um, and we also, for the time being, do not find a difference uh, between regions or over time. Of course, as I said, as I stressed, these are preliminary findings. It might be that what we find in the full sample is completely different. Um, and hopefully the full sample also will allow us to uh, look at some other variations. Um, to be a lot more specific in these immigrant groups or ethnic or, or ethnicities. Um, we could also look at uh, different classifications, for example, white versus non-white, etc. cetera. Um, we could also look uh, in a little bit more detail whether there is an effect of legislation, as I said in the beginning. So um, on the first glance, it does not seem to be the case as we do not find any difference across regions or time. But with the more detailed data, we could just um, include a dummy variable, which is one if a country had an anti-discrimination legislation in a specific year, and then um, see whether this dummy is significant, for example. So that is um, the first study in a class that I wanted to discuss. The second one is also on the immigrant native wage gap, but from a very different um, perspective. And I've titled it a fair immigrant native wage gap, which might be a little bit triggering as a title, but hopefully you will understand what I mean by this um, after the presentation. So the motivation for this um, study is again a paper on the, the gender wage gap. Um, which is a survey experiment. Maybe some of you who are familiar with survey experiments know about this paper, it's quite a famous one, um, which has shown that um, Germans find that it is fair that a woman with the same qualifications doing the same occupation earns about 20% less than a man doing this job. And um, interestingly, that's also more or less the real gender wage gap in Germany. So uh, this made us think whether we could actually replicate these findings for the gender, uh, for the ethnic wage gap. And then um, if we extrapolate our small sample findings um, of the meta-analysis, if we also find that people think it is fair that immigrants earn 5% less than natives, for example. And if we do find um, that there is such a fair um, wage gap, we can also have a look at what factors uh, determine the extent of this gap. So we do this by means of, an, of a survey experiment. And um, I think the easiest way to have an idea of what this experiment looks like is to try it out. So if you scan this QR code with your phone, you will be taken to a very short example of um, this experiment, um, simplified example. So feel free to do that, um, take a minute, otherwise uh, take a bathroom break, take some water, um, and uh, then I will continue in a minute. It won't take longer than that.
the survey is only one question, right? Yes, exactly. Yeah, it's, it's just an example. So for this example, it's only one question. So this experiment is what we call a survey experiment, um, which means that each participant is shown a profile of a worker um, and their respective wage and are subsequently asked to evaluate the fairness of this wage. So this is what you normally um, have just done. And then um, the, the elements making up this profile, so the ethnic background, the wage level, and all other um, relative uh, relevant factors vary randomly and independently. So if everything went well, all of you were shown a different worker, different profile. Um, so what do these profiles look like? Um, in the real experiment, it's a little bit more complex than the, the short example that I shown. Um, so the profiles could be either uh, male or female. They could um, work as a waiter, a caregiver, an electrician, a nurse, a financial analyst, and or a medical doctor. So it shows um, two low-skilled occupations, two middle-skilled occupations, and two high-skilled occupations. And for each of these uh, skill levels, uh, health care occupation, and then another one, um, they could have either just a Swiss nationality or they could have a double nationality. So they could be Swiss and Kosovo, Swiss and Eritrean, and Swiss and, and Sri Lankan. Uh, we chose these um, nationalities because our, these are the largest um, diasporas of uh, European, Asian, and African origins in Switzerland. And then they could have uh, passed an employment spells of one month, two years, or there could be no information on their unemployment spells. Um, they could have a 2.5 GPA, a 4.5 GPA, or again, no information on their GPA. They could have um, different levels of soft skills, so they could be just friendly. Um, they could have uh, good team spirit, um, good team skills and communication skills, or again, no information on these skills. And then uh, their wage level ranges uh, from, every, from 0 0.5 times to 1.5 times the median wage in this occupation. So this is um, to make them also realistic. If we would just assign uh, nominal wages, it would not be realistic to have the same range for a waiter as you have for the medical doctor, for example. And then, um, as you also saw, you the respondent is asked to make a judgment about these wages um, with this wage. So from your point of view, do you think uh, these earnings are fair, unfairly too low or unfairly too high uh, on a mi minus five to five point scale with minus five being unfairly too low and five unfairly too high. Uh, this type of experiment has certain advantages. Uh, mostly the fact that the factors are completely uncorrelated by design. Um, so for example, that means that someone's immigrant background is not correlated with their occupation, which is of course not true if you just look at registered data. We know that it's a lot more likely to find immigrants in caregiver occupations than it is uh, for financial analysts, for example. So this again goes back to what I said in the beginning, this allows us to give a causal interpretation to our findings. A second advantage of this type of experiment is that it limits social desirability bias. So people will probably be answering more truthfully than if you would simply ask them, do you think an immigrant should earn less than a native for the same job? But of course, we need to keep in mind that it's still an artificial experiment. People know that they are participating in an experiment so they will, or they might still answer in a social desirable way. Um, then uh, for the logistics, so the, the experiment is online as in the example with Qualtrics. Um, as opposed to the example, each participant in the, the real experiment will be shown 10 profiles. Um, we will fill it in Switzerland and in the US. And then we ask a number of post-experimental questions, which also allows us to see a little bit whether these um, ratings are different depending on the 
type of person answering. And then um, we have uh, so far done a pretest with uh, about 45 students in Geneva at the University of Geneva. Um, so I will show you the findings of um, this pretest, but keep in mind that it's a small sample. And most importantly, it's quite a specific sample. So it's young, highly educated people. And we cannot expect them to be representative of a general population. And also the final experiment will be slightly different than the one we pretested. So for the outcome, the earnings, um, how fair do people think these earnings are? We see that people used the full answering range, so everything from minus five to five. They were most likely to say that the, fair, the earnings were fair. Um, and they were a little bit more likely to say that the earnings were unfairly too low than uh, unfairly too high. What we are interested, of course, in, in, of course, is whether the fact that somebody has a double national, nationality impacts this uh, fairness rating. So to have a first look at that, we simply split the sample into those profiles with a double nationality and those profiles without a double nationality. And if we do find that there is a fair ethnic wage gap, we expect to find that those without a double nationality, the, the earnings of those without a double nationality are on average rated lower than those with a double nationality. So this is what is shown here on the, the graph. And as you can see, those without a double nationality are indeed rated a little bit lower than uh, the earnings of those with a double nationality. But the difference is really small and uh, not significant. And this is also what we see from a first, first uh, very simple regression analysis. So um, what you see here in the first column is when we group all of the double nationalities into a simple dummy variable. And um, you can see that this is not significant. So it does not have a significant influence on this um, fairness rating, whether somebody has double nationality or not. And the same is true if you look at all of these different um, nationalities. So it does not uh, matter which um, double nationality a person has. Uh, but um, as I said in the beginning, this is probably due to the fact that it is a very specific sample. And uh, what makes us think this is that we also do not find an effect of gender, which other studies using a general population sample consistently find. So this is an indication that our sample is a lot more aware of these issues. We do find some other um, significant results. So we find that um, the, the earnings of young people are more likely to be rated as unfairly too high. Um, we also find a clear um, effect of occupation. So the earnings of waiters and caregivers are more likely to be rated as unfairly too low. And the ratings of the, the wages of doctors and financial analysis especially are more likely to be rated as unfairly too high. We find an effect of um, having studied abroad, which is a factor we will not include in our final experiment, but interesting nevertheless, those who have completed their studies abroad are more likely to, um, the, the earnings of those people are more likely to be rated as unfairly too high. And uh, we also find an effect of the wage, which is simply the higher the wage, the more likely people are um, to rate this wage as uh, unfairly too high. So this is all in line with what we would expect. Uh, we also included a number of questions uh, to see if there were any issues with the experiment, which is of course the reason why we did the pretest. Um, so we asked whether they thought it was difficult to make the judgments, um, some, uh, the most people somewhat agreed or agreed, um, but there's also some who somewhat disagreed. Um, we asked whether they thought there were many, too many profiles to judge and here the majority disagreed um, and no one agreed. And uh, sorry, I, I missed this one. We asked whether they thought the profiles were realistic and here again, um, 
most of them agreed, no one disagreed. So on gener in general, this is very comforting for us. Um, we also uh, asked them if they had an idea of the topic of the study to see whether um, they managed to pinpoint the um, double nationality as really the subject of the, the study. And um, from the 43 rep responses we got on this question, uh, the mo majority mentioned nationality in conjunction with other factors. So they said it's about gender, nationality, and um, occupation. 16 did not mention nationality at all, and only six only talked about mentioned nationality. So they really managed to pinpoint this. So not completely um, comforting, but not also super um, discerning either. So next steps, again, as I said, uh, work in progress. So we're currently um, in the process of running the full experiment, which will be re with a representative sample of respondents this time. Um, and it will be fielded in all three language regions of Switzerland and in the US. And for the US, of course, we make some adaptations. Uh, we will use different ethnicities and um, also adapt to wage levels. And then with a full sample, we will be able to, to have a more detailed analysis. So we will be able to do some heterogeneity analysis depending on the respondents. So are, do women answer differently than men, people who have an immigration background themselves? Um, and we will also be able to look at some interactions, for example, between immigrant backgrounds and skill levels. So to conclude um, the presentation, uh, first, I wanted to highlight again the importance of being clear in the concepts we use. So discrimination is not the same as disadvantage. It's not the same as racism. Not to say that all of these are important issues that merit to be studied, but just um, that it's important to be clear. Then from the first um, study that I showed, we find preliminary uh, findings that there is no immigrant native wage gap in the proper sense, but there are clear um, ethnic hierarchies. So this wage gap seems to depend a lot on um, the specific origin or ethnicity. From the second uh, study, it, we can conclude so far that students believe that immigrants and natives should earn the same. Um, but as I said, it's work in progress. Um, we do not know if we will find the same with a general population sample. So I am looking very much forward to your questions, inputs, suggestions, uh, feedback. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Um, uh, Van Bell, for this great presentation. I really enjoyed it. And uh, just so I don't take any of uh, the discussion time, I'm going to open the floor for any questions, any discussions, any thoughts that you would like to share uh, with us today. You can unmute yourself and ask the question. You can also write the question uh, in the chat box, um, whatever you prefer. Hi. Hello. Hi. Um, I have a couple of questions. I think my first question is about the link between the two parts of this paper. So um, I see that they're in a way measuring the same thing and I see the, the point of comparing methodologies, but I'm not sure um, how, yeah, how intuitive it is to compare different contexts, for example, right? So whatever you find in Switzerland, of course you can compare it to your findings from a meta-analysis, but uh, I don't see the kind of the, yeah. So can you just explain to, to me a bit uh, more the purpose of this type of comparison? Yes, so um, I completely agree. It's, it's two different studies. I um, grouped them here just because they have the same topic. So it's immigrant native wage gap. And since both of them are work in progress, I don't think I could fill 40 minutes with either of them just uh, on their own. Um, but of course, um, very different contexts um, and also a different um, point of view. So as I said, the, the example of the gender wage gap, they do actually find that Germans um, think a gender wage gap of 20% is fair, which 
happens to be the wage gap in Germany, but this is could also be clear just coincidence, of course, it's not because the attitudes of people towards something are wanting that this has anything to do with the true um, extent of the wage gap we find. It could also be that we find a huge ethnic wage gap if we have all of the, the results, um, but we do not find that people think this is fair at all or the other way around, of course. Yeah. So maybe then one way is for you to kind of like provide measures of the wage gap for Switzerland, right? And for example, the earning structure survey, I think would be a very good, uh, good way to start, right? It's a huge survey, it has like a couple of million employees. Um, so it's conducted every other year, but it has a very big sample. Yes, and uh, we will also do the experiment in the US, but there, um, of course, it's, it's always a different um, setting because in the US, we tend to talk a lot more about ethnicities and in a European context, we always talk about immigrants. Yeah, so one, I think one issue with the earning structure survey that I was proposing is that it doesn't have information about the exact ethnicity. So it would be just a pure native wage gap, mm -hmm. native, native immigrant wage gap. I think the labor force survey may have more information on that or you may have to use administrative data. Thank you. Thank you for the suggestions. Do we have any comments, suggestions, questions in the house? I guess I have a number of questions. Um, and the first is to this to this conclusion that there is no immigrant native wage gap, um, right? And if maybe I'm wrong here, um, <laughs> or I don't understand this correctly, but um, this conclusion comes from, from the fact that you actually found a huge spread in the meta-analysis of wage gaps. Um, and this huge spread over zero um, of the confidence interval over zero led to an insignificance, right? Um, so I would wonder whether that is not a little bit too inconclusive to, to say that there is no wage gap just because different uh, papers found different um, wage gaps in different directions and then the agglomeration leads to, to an insignificant result. That's exactly what I uh, wanted to say. So um, what I mean with this is that there is no one immigrant native wage gap, which is also, of course, what we would expect. So if we compare it to a gender wage gap here, then we can clearly say this is the gender wage gap, which is not a case for the immigrant native wage gap, but is that's of course not a surprise because we are comparing a very heterogeneous group of people in very different countries, very different settings. So I, the conclusion is not at all that there is no immigrant native wage discrimination. The conclusion is just that there is a lot more heterogeneity um, going on. And that is exactly what we want to um, look at more into detail, especially when we have the full sample. So, so I understand that there is no one single phenomenon exactly. that, that can be measured. Okay, interesting. And in your work, have you come across any sort of indication that the type of migration matters in determining the wage gap? Or if what there is do you, one? you mean by type, you mean labor migration versus refugee? For example, forced migration or family migration or what other things we're seeing? At the moment, we, we have not done the analysis on that such okay. a detailed level, but we would be able to. I, especially, um, there's a, quite a lot of studies also on internal displacement, um, especially if you look at um, Asian studies, for example. Um, so uh, in with the final data set, we will be able to look at all of these things. Interesting. And then my last question, I guess, um, I know these studies are not concluded, not done, but maybe um, off the top of your head, you could go into the policy implications of your findings. That is um, always difficult, of course. Um, also, if we find, yeah, if we find that people think it is fair, for example, from the second um, experiment, if people think it is fair um, that immigrants earn less than the natives, how do you? What, what would be your policy implication there? I'm, I'm really not sure. Okay, and, and do you know, um, maybe I'm stretching it a bit, but do you know um, from your research 
which policies governments or which spread of policies exist to to address this native immigrant wage gap and does um, that play a role in your in, in the studies you look at for your meta-analysis um and that's something i can look into but the the majority um of at least western countries uh, us and european countries have this anti-discrimination legislation uh, which is a lot of words on paper uh, very very rarely put into a court or um, that there is actually any uh, um, rep repercussions uh, for this so it could be interesting to have a look at countries that actually have more or less um, stringent uh, legislation in the second um, second time to see if we find a difference there yes yeah my thought here is in you also mentioned that that a wage gap doesn't always originate in discrimination but also in for example different educational attainments that are just uh, structuralized um and, and in those cases that i i'd imagine that um anti-discrimination laws would have very little ground to to any effect mm -hmm. but if that is the the case then we should see that papers who control or not control for education mm -hmm. should find different structurally different wage gaps which from again I, I want to be very careful of making any definite conclusions here but from the sample that we have so far this does not seem to be the case okay thank you so much any other questions I, I just have an additional question about the meta study so I don't have um, experience myself with meta studies. However, to me, it seems this seems to be a literature where it is really hard to get to any causal estimates, right? And then gender gender wage gap it has the same issue. So um, even there, although the I guess there is consensus that there is a wage gap. I'm sure there are people who disagree with that even, right? And then it will all depend on the type of controls that you would include. So for me, I'm just wondering whether there is like any good practices. Were there any good practices in this literature even, right? So how, how should one conduct such an analysis? Maybe from your experience, you can maybe give us some insights. I think exactly as you say, there is no real solution to this uh, causality issue um, because of course um, you cannot, I mean, the ideal would be an experiment, uh, randomized control where you put people into different groups and then it's not something you can do in a real life setting with people and their earnings. Um, so I think the best practice is um, what I said. So it's this either this wage regression where you just um, try to control for the maximum uh, possible uh, number of controls that could influence the wage um, and or the uh, decomposition analysis, which is based on the same principle. So the more controls um, you have, the more um, you should approach a causal estimate rather than a correlation um, and especially if you think about um, ethnicity what could influence wages is education language skills um, experience so if you control for all of these uh, occupational selection if you control for all of these possible confounding factors then that should start to approach the the discrimination which is of course never going to be perfect but what our meta-analysis allows us to do is to see whether this actually makes an Im impact. So does it actually matter that papers control for these or not? Um, which gives an idea of how important these elements are in the determination of a wage as compared to what is left, which is then discrimination. Yeah, so I just wanted to say, so it's not clear that all controls are good controls as well. And if, for example, people of different ethnicities are discriminated at the point at which they enter in college, or especially in the, uh, uh, for example, whether they qualify for different occupations, which for me would be, for example, uh, a bad control. And indeed, you were saying that conditional on occupations, uh, any effects tend to disappear. So the, the wage gap tends to be smaller. So it's not even clear that more controls are better empirical strategies sometimes. No, is, but that depends. More on what you want to measure as well. So I completely agree that discrimination is a dynamic process, but if you want to measure wage discrimination at a certain point in time, 
more controls are better, which does not mean that the wage discrimination at a certain point in time cannot be caused by previous discrimination in education in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. this is a very fair point for education, but for occupation, I would still argue that if, um, yeah, if immigrants uh, don't have access to high wage occupations, then by definition, the, the wage gap will be high. But yeah, thank you very I, much. Yes, it's a, it's a similar argument as for the gender wage gap again, right? It's but then if you do not control for argument uh, for occupation, then the people who say that there is no gender wage gap will argue that it's women self-selecting in occupations and not discrimination there. So yeah, it's it's a whole de debate which is uh, interesting and hopefully um, our meta analysis will be able to pinpoint some of the things that are. Does it really matter whether we control for occupation or not, for example? Hello, thank you very much for your talk. I found it very interesting. And this is really not my field, so this could go very badly wrong as a warning. Um, much prefer things written down so, as a brief warning. Um, but I, if I'm correct, you didn't even account for whether people accounted for how long people had been in the country. Because presumably in my mind, as a lawyer, that would be a large impact in whether or not there was a wage gap, because as someone's in the country longer, they will hopefully become more and more accustomed to society and things like recognition of qualifications would facilitate them to access employment for which they were qualified. So surely that actually would have a large implication for whether or not initially there is a wage gap, maybe overall there isn't, but actually, for the first three years they're in the country, if there is, that's still a large impact on those people and the ability of them to migrate. Yeah, we, that's a good point. We do control for um, this, but as with all of the controls, we just, um, so it's, it's just a dummy variable. So it's one, if the paper does control for some form of length since migration and zero otherwise. So what we can say is, whether it's important to control for this, but we cannot say whether there is a difference between three months and three years, for example. But there is a whole literature on this um, to see how, how quickly migrants catch up. Uh, so uh, yes, we do control for this. If you don't have any more questions, maybe I can ask my question. <laughs> um, well, I'm not sure if this is something that you already spoke about or not, um, but have you mentioned anything about like recruitment, uh, being recruited, recruited through a recruitment agencies having uh, a, an effect on the wage of a migrant? That is something we have no... This is maybe um, a suggestion, like then if you haven't mentioned it and then maybe I can suggest something because I've been working a lot about um, on recruitment agencies and uh, recruitment procedures, uh, particularly in Europe. And um, uh, most of the times, uh, actually migrants, especially when they're regular or want to um, travel regularly to work in Europe, they're recruited through a recruitment agency. And in most times, these recruitment agencies, they do have some sort of a fee. Uh, so technically, at a point of time, even though the migrant would be technically should be earning their own money, uh, they still have to pay back the recruitment agency. They still have to uh, pay uh, the, the fee for the contract, uh, for living in the country. So there's a lot of abuse that happens uh, or, or discrimination that happens through these recruitment agencies that does um, uh, affect the wage. Like they already set the standards super low, especially when it comes to hospitality and jobs in hospitality. And um, uh, yeah, they, they already say, yeah, yeah, we're gonna give you 10 euros per hour, even though the actual employer could be paying more but there is always this gap, I would say, where they could be technically the recruitment agency earning the money of the migrant or indirectly having the migrant um, earn less. So I think um, uh, being recruited through a recruitment agency could have uh, potentially an effect on the, the wage gap, but 
but of course I don't know. Mm -hmm. That's something it's very interesting, but it's quite difficult to see from the secondhand data because we have, in most cases, um, you have the, the wage data, but you don't have information on which part of this wage is kept for myself. But um, one thing that could be interesting is to, what was also stressed before, is to have a look at the type of migrants. So I guess in this case, um, these are really labor migrants and high skills labor migrants who come through these recruiting agencies. But they're also sometimes low skilled, like they also work in like agriculture, mm -hmm. um, work um, fishing and all of this. So yeah. it's both, I would say. Maybe if we manage to control some how for this type of migration, we could already um, catch this in some way. But it's definitely a very interesting approach. Did not think about this before. Uh, we still more or less have four minutes, five minutes. If any, if there are any more questions, um, okay. Uh, Mariam uh, is writing that uh, it would be helpful to have more recruitment agency advocating for migrants, for example, where employers telling them they don't want certain migrant groups, certain accents, etc. Yeah. And there is on the hiring discrimination, of course, that's more straightforward. There has been um, quite a lot of studies, also more policy um, studies on discrimination happening, happening in recruitment agencies. And it's always very <laughs> confronting how I mean, it's it's probably even higher than uh, in di with direct recruitment, uh, even though there is this hiring discrimination everywhere. Like I've like I I know that like I don't want to talk so much about recruitment agencies just because it's uh, not part of your study. But I know, as a matter of fact, that recruitment agencies could themselves be actually uh, they could initiate discrimination. So, for instance, they are more likely to choose a migrant that is European than a migrant that's not European. So they have already like all of these discrimination within the agencies. Uh, but I, uh, something that I would also like to add is that, for example, in the Netherlands, I'll give a small example. Uh, the government ha has like this this law of like free, um, like that the recruitment agencies just have like a free, uh, they, they just like regulate themselves, basically. And because the, the government gives them this power, um, they, they really tend to abuse insanely the, 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 the salaries of um, the migrants, especially migrants that don't really know the rights. Uh, so like when it comes to advocating the rights for migrants, I don't really think they care because they, they're doing it for money. They're not doing it as a, because the, most of them are also private companies. So they want the best for themselves. But yeah, I mean, I hope that uh, one day recruitment agencies would advocate actually for migrants and not allow employers to set these rules and uh, discriminations in recruitment processes. But yeah, maybe it could be like an idea for you and perhaps like the recommendation section or something. Mm -hmm. on, uh, but yeah, so. Thank you. Yeah. Um, if we don't have any more questions, uh, then uh, let's conclude our seminar. Thank you so much for the, the presentation, for the insight, and I'm sure it's going to help many of the students attending, especially like figuring out methods for uh, their thesis, uh, especially if they're starting to write their master's thesis. Um, for, um, we have, uh, do we have any? Oh. I have been rescheduling a lot of the seminars lately, so I am sorry, I can't recall like the seminar that we have next in March, but I'm going to, um, uh, you're going to find it anyway on the website uh, of UNU Merit. So if you just type UNU Merit future events, you're gonna find all the migration seminars. I also post them uh, often on my LinkedIn um, and I share them if you're on the list of uh, UNU Merit. If you would like to be on the list of UNU Merit where I send you a direct email, please let me know, send me an email after the seminar and I'll add you on the list. Uh, otherwise, the recording of this seminar is going to be available hopefully in maybe uh, a week. Uh, and yeah, thank you very much again for the, the presentation and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.